Good evening, and welcome to the Hollywood Babylonians. Hello, 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 friends! This is your happy Hollywood history host, Mr. Benjamin Burke, with our very first episode of the Hollywood Babylonians, your favorite classic film and Hollywood history podcast in which we discuss the greatest films of old Hollywood and the history behind them. And for the very first episode of this wonderful new podcast, I have my wonderful friend, who's also a wonderful actress, she's a wonderful scenic painter, and she's a wonderful lover of classic films, Miss Mallory Harwell. Hello, I'm Mallory, and I am big. It's just the webcams that got small. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm excited, happy to be here. Would you like to tell our listeners why you love classic film, how you got interested in listening sure. and watching classic film? Yeah. So it was pretty much brought on immediately with my family. Like, it was big into, we were all big into classic movies. I was kind of brought up. My favorite series, funnily enough, I have the picture still here of Nick and Nora from the Thin Man series. I yes. grew up on the Thin Man series. Yes. Uh, but then I was always into, like, classic films, typically, like, the more scary or more uh, dramatic films. But then, of course, my mother was really into, like, the musicals and got me, like, raised up on, like, all of the old classic musicals, MJ musicals. And I kind of grew up around that era uh, in history for film that I really enjoyed. And nobody else ever did in my friend group growing up, not a single other person. Uh, and and then, then I ran into this guy in college. This guy. So yes, I mean, my, my interest in Hollywood classic film is very similar. It's like I grew up, I have two amazing, wonderful parents that I love spending time with, but I also love spending time with my grandparents. So what I would do is like they'd constantly have TCM on because they loved watching old movies too. And so after I watched enough TCM, then they would take me to like Hastings or the public library. Hastings, rest in peace. I miss course. Hastings. So yes, I nice. do too. But we would um, we would like rent different classic films on VHS, of course. I like wore out their classic film department. It's like <laughs> after a month of me going through their classic film department, their VHSs wouldn't play anymore because I watched them so much. But we'd go and we'd pick out several classic films at the public library or at Hastings. And then we'd like, I'd have sleepovers and we'd watch each of those different classic films throughout the night, which was so much fun. And then, like you said, growing up, everybody in my friend group, they knew I loved like old stuff. Black but... and white films. That was kind oh. of what the, yeah, that was the, what they knew like of those films. Like, oh. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And then all of my friends were like, I don't like black and white. And I was like, what in the hell? heck are you talking about like we met each other in college and nobody in my friend group ever had loved classic films it's like everybody that loved classic films was much older than me and then you and i were at a party uh at, in undergrad when we first uh, like one of the first times we really talked to each other uh, we were talking about different movies and at that time i had over 300 classic films on dvd and it's only got bigger it's only yes got it's over <laughs> yeah it's over 600 classic films on DVD and Blu-ray right now, which isn't, it's just a sick obsession. It is you at know? this point. And I enable you, so it doesn't help. <laughs> I mean, many people enable me. Every, That's true. Yeah. I, I refuse to take myself. responsibility for you buying 60. Like every time I talk to him again, <laughs> like I'll get on another phone call with him. Just like, what's up? And instead of telling me like about his day or whatever, he's like, I got six new classic films. I went ahead and got them. They came out on Blu-ray and he like goes through the list. For anyone who doesn't know Ben, he is an encyclopedia of old film knowledge. And he remembers all of them with startling clarity. Like I, I love old films, but he has a, just a great memory like i can like forget an actor's name i'll like forget what year it was or what the director was and he will pop it up in a second it's, it takes him zero seconds to like figure out and i like was like oh my god this is another well, level it's not exactly something to be proud of like i said it's i think it is show. okay well, that's good. I i'm saying well, it's i was impressed when we talked about like classic films that you were able to like bust out all the knowledge and i was like okay all right well, I appreciate I'm not it. as big a fan, apparently. Like, I was very, I was <laughs> stunned at how good oh. you were. 
Yes, I stun many people. Thank you for your <laughs> affirmation. Like we were both at a college party our freshman year and we hadn't really talked much. We started talking about different classic films and there were some juniors there and we were just wee little freshmen and I was talking about all these classic films and you were like the first person that I had met who it could match me movie for movie in Hollywood history fact for Hollywood history fact. And I was like, who is this woman? Because nobody around my own age had ever... Um, had ever loved classic uh, Hollywood film as much as I do. You had to be, you're one of my best friends from college, best friends, period. So I knew you had to be the first person on this episode that I have. And also, you've been touched by Esther Williams. I have. Can you tell us about that? Oh my God, that sounds bad. Uh, but <laughs> She took her fist? I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> so uh, when I, I didn't actually know this about this. My mother told me the story years later. Uh, when I was still in my mother's stomach, uh, she, I, she was very pregnant at the time and my mother hated people touching her belly, like, and not having consent for touching. She was like, no, don't touch me. But she ran into an old what, Esther Williams back in the day. Um, and, uh, she, Esther Williams came over and was like, oh, and like, that was like the one person my mother was kind of okay with touching her stomach. And that somewhere she still has a picture of her, like with Esther Williams touching a, a young fetus me. And it was uh, the only picture I have with a celebrity. Is, is <laughs> But you know what? It's a pretty quality shot. So I'll have to find that at some point. But everybody who doesn't know who Esther Williams is, she was one of big, MGM's biggest contract stars during the mm -hmm. 1940s and early 1950s. She was like responsible for starting the giant, big Technicolor Aquacade musicals. Because mm -hmm. she had been, she was supposed to be in the 1940 Olympics. But because Hitler, uh, Hitler was a thing in 1940 Europe, uh, those European... Olympics were canceled. So instead, she went and she signed a contract in 1941 and she became one of the top 10 box office stars for five years running. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what she Who do. would look so beautiful swimming? He would never think like, oh, she's gorgeous. Like every time oh, yeah. I see her swimming, I'm just like, oh, it's oh, like her sure. sets are I mean, always she... pretty. She looks amazing. It's awesome. She's gorgeous, period. Go check out her movies. Uh, yeah. It would start with like Bathing Beauty or Thrill of a Romance, maybe mm -hmm. Neptune's Daughter. I mean, oh, there's yeah. a whole slew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which actually, he got me for my birthday one year, like a, a good box set of Esther Williams like collection. It was really good. I still have I it. I did. On DVD. And now the Warner Archive collection is doing beautiful restorations on these um, old Technicolor uh, negatives to put them out on Blu-ray. So check out the Blu-rays, check out the DVDs. They are, um, they're amazing. It's time to talk about our first classic Hollywood film for our very first episode of the Hollywood Babylonians. It's incredibly exciting. It's Billy Wilder's 1950 film noir tell-all Hollywood drama, Sunset Boulevard. Starring Gloria Swanson, William Holden, Nancy Olsen, and Eric von Stroheim. Sunset Boulevard is packed with spectacle, entertainment value, and comedic value if you find terribly sad things funny. It's, you know. it's good for that. Like, it's the one, not to jump the gun on this, but it's like one of the best things about it is that it can be both. If you are a lover of like serious discussion about Hollywood and what what happens to people in, in celebrity culture, you can talk, have a really sad, serious discussion, but it's also really campy. Like her, everything she says is a meme. I'm surprised they don't have quotes of her on TikTok. I looked through a lot of classic TikTok uh, film stuff, and they don't have a lot of Sunset Boulevard stuff. Mm -hmm. But every line from her is great and is good for those dramatic moments. Everything is, like, fun. Oh, for sure. I'm going to start with production history on Sunset Boulevard and some of the thematic values and thematic things in the film that I think are very important. So I'm going to start with this quote by Joseph L. Mankiewicz, who was a producer in Hollywood. But Joseph L. Mankiewicz, during some time late 30s, mid to late 30s, early 40s, was a producer at MGM. And MGM was known for being the very Never Never Land, because L.B. Mayer was head of it. And he did not like, like, uber realistic films. He hated film noir. He hated, like, the dark women's pictures that Betty Davis had made at Warner Brothers. Some it was all Technicolor <laughs> Beauty and Magic, right? It was... Um, even the melodramas were very sweet. They all had heart. Um, so Joseph L. Mankiewicz said on a film called Strange Cargo, 1940, with Joan Crawford and Clark Gable, he said it was almost a good film. I wish it could have been made later. It was tough doing any kind of film that even approached reality in any way. And I feel like that's true for Hollywood leading up 
really to Sunset Boulevard. And it was really Billy Wilder and his partner at Paramount, Charles Brackett, that kind of started to push the bounds of that with the production code, with what was expected by the Hollywood elite, by the yes men in Hollywood at that point, they started to push that. So they were both, Billy Wilder, Charles Brackett were pretty much partners at Paramount Studios during the late 30s, throughout the 1940s, and then they broke up right after Sunset Boulevard wrapped shooting. But just to give you all listeners kind of a feel of the studio system during this time, uh, studio systems were studios during the golden age of Hollywood were pretty much big repertory companies. All of their stars were under contract to the studios, all of the directors, all of the writers, the cinematographers, the musicians, everybody really was owned by the studios and the studio heads and the press machines that perpetuated um, all of the all of the Hollywood gossip for in behind the scenes Hollywood. So Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett would get together. They'd write the films that they made at Paramount. Then Billy Wilder would direct. Charles Brackett would um, produce. Billy Wilder grew up in Vienna. He moved to Berlin in 1926 to work as a writer at a German film uh, studio called Ufa. Uh, it's UFA. It's a German name. I can't pronounce it, so we're just going to skip over that. Um, <laughs> but he fled Berlin to Paris when he, uh, where he directed his first film, um, but fled to America in 1934 aboard the Aquitania because at the time, of course, the Nazis were taking over Europe. And he said that he fled to America in 1934 because he didn't want to end up in an oven which also kind of adds to, I know, that's a big statement to make, but Billy Wilder. But accurate, weirdly enough. I know, I know, no, no, it was very accurate. And, you know, all of his films, well, Billy Wilder kind of writing on his own, especially after finishing working with Charles Brackett when you move into the 50s, like Stalag 17, Love in the Afternoon. What is the film with Marilyn? Oh, um, Some Like It Hot. Oh. They all yeah. kind of had like this dark cynicism towards American culture, towards life in general. Yeah. And um, his, uh, somebody, one of his co-workers said that Billy Wilder uh, was the only like Jewish film director in Hollywood during that time whose parents were killed in the Holocaust. They were killed at a concentration camp. So he kind of had a dark worldview in general. Yeah. But he ended up at Paramount Studios, you know, long story short. He, of course, ended up ended up at Paramount Studios. And then Charles Brackett came from an upper crust Northeastern family, and he went to Harvard Law School. He was a Harvard Law man from the Northeast with a I'm lot sure of money. I'm sure he told everybody about that. Right, I <laughs> As know. all Harvard men do. I yes, went to Harvard. I know. I mean, honestly, if we went to Harvard, I'd tell everybody I went to Harvard. That's right. Um, but he wrote short stories for the New York Times on top of, like, his law career. And then finally, he caught the attention of Hollywood, where he started work as a writer at RKO Studios. And then he finally, um, he worked at MGM for a little bit, but he finally ended up at Paramount. So Billy Wilder, Charles Brackett, finally, I believe it was, oh, the head of the writing department at Paramount. I have his name written down somewhere here, but I can't remember where it is. All right, that's okay. So the head of the writing department at Paramount put those Oh, it was Manny Wolf. And Billy Wilder was high strung, tenacious, and was known as having no taste or tact as a writer whatsoever. And Charles <laughs> Brackett was conservative, grounded, and tasteful. So Manny Wolf put them together because he thought they might balance each other out. And according to Manny Wolf, in the beginning, it was terrible because they were constantly trying to rip each other's heads off. But once they were, the children were able to settle down and come together, they wrote some amazing things. Yeah. So their first project that they worked on together at Paramount was Bluebe Bluebeard's Eighth Wife, Claudette yes. Colbert and Gary Cooper, um, which I saw on TCM a long time ago. It's a very entertaining kind of like screwball romantic comedy. But uh, then the following year in 1939, uh, they worked with director Ernst Lubitsch and they co-wrote Ninochka for Greta Garbo, which was like their first big massive success. So then they went back to Paramount and they made... Uh, very, very successful films throughout the 1940s, such as Hold Back the Dawn, Ball of Fire, The Major and the Minor, Five Graves to Cairo, Double Indemnity, Lost Weekend, 
1945, which won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Adapted Screenplay, the, and then they made The Emperor Waltz a Foreign Affair. So by 1948, when they were starting to think about Sunset Boulevard and writing this, they were really, they were known as the happiest couple in Hollywood, and they were really the golden children at Paramount. You know, they were kind of like Judy Garland was to MGM or Betty Grable was to Param or Betty Grable was to Fox. They were um, very, very high prized and high priced um, studio assets. So in 1948, um, they had just finished, they had, well, their film, A Foreign Affair, had just.